Uh, my name's Rosanna. I'm a psychiatry trainee. Um, and before I started psychiatry, I uh, did a few years of paediatrics, um, not as a trainee, um, just as a sort of trust grade doctor in various London hospitals, um, in various uh, paediatric specialties, um, and did my paediatric membership with a view to that being useful to be a child psychiatrist in the future. Um, as you can see on the on the front here, um, this talk is with thanks to Jessica Salkind, who is a also a paediatric doctor in London, um, with whom I've worked on uh, LGBT teaching for medical students, and some of the resources that are part of these slides are from her. So definitely thanks to her. Um, so to make a start, um, there's three main sort of themes to this talk. Firstly, um, I just want to address kind of the main um, concepts here and, and think about why is this even important? Why does it matter? Um, secondly, I want to look at why LGBT young people have worse mental health than other young people. And thirdly, to look at what we can do about it. Um, I've got some cases and discussions to use along the way. Um, and, and for part of that discussion, like I said, we can use the chat function or people can unmute themselves. Um, okay, this is a bit of a, re um, a refresher of the, the talk that I did at the London Paediatrics Teaching at the Royal School of the Royal Society of Medicine um, last year, um, but it's a little bit updated. So just some basic information. So to start off with, I just thought I'd share this graph that is from a YouGov survey done in 2015. And this is responses from 18 to 24 year olds. Um, they used a scale called this Kinsey scale, which is uh, used to measure sexuality. Um, they used a fairly sort of crude way of measuring that they just asked people if zero is exclusively heterosexual and six is exclusively homosexual, where would you put yourself? Um, and amongst 18 to 24 year olds, less than half of them put themselves as exclusively heterosexual. And that percentage increased um, with age, but essentially what that shows us is that young people are more fluid in their sexuality, more open to the idea of not being exclusively heterosexual. Um, and although obviously this data starts with 18 year olds, we know that similar is true for under 18s as well, probably even more so. So there's a lot of different definitions for sexual orientations and romantic orientations. Um, but what I would generally say is don't learn what the definition of each one is, because actually the definition is going to be somewhat different for each person that uses a word to identify themselves. Um, and if you come across a young person that uses a term to describe themselves and you don't know what it is, you can just ask them, not ask them for teaching, but ask them, what does that mean to you? so that you get a better understanding of who the young person in front of you is. So we talk about sex and gender. Generally speaking, sex means someone's physical characteristics. And there's actually a lot of different ways of defining that. There's, it's not that straightforward because we can talk about um, someone's hormones. We can talk about someone's secondary sexual characteristics like facial hair. Um, we can talk about the gonads that someone has, the external genitalia, their DNA, did they have a Y chromosome or not, um, all of those different things which contribute to someone's sex. And obviously sometimes those can be a bit complicated and lead to someone having an intersex condition. Um, I'm not going to go into that here because intersex conditions deserve a whole talk in their own right. Um, but it's worth bearing in mind that um, generally, we think of sex as binary, male and female, but there's a lot of different characteristics that, that add up to that. And then we also talk about gender. So there's a few definitions here to go over. Um, cisgender means a person who identifies as the gender that they were assigned at birth and that matches with the sex characteristics that they have. Um, so that means the majority of the population are cisgender. They identify with the gender 
that they were assigned and that, that fits with the, their body. Um, it's often abbreviated just to cis. Other definitions that we've got here are transgender, which is when somebody doesn't identify with the gender that they were assigned at birth, um, or the, the sex that, that fits the characteristics that they have physically. And that can fall into binary or non-binary, binary being male and female. Um, so somebody who's transgender may identify with a binary gender of male or female, or they may identify as non-binary, so that being outside of the binary of male or female. And within that non-binary, they may identify with a more masculine gender or a more feminine gender, or they may reject the concept of binary genders altogether and feel that male and female just don't apply to them. Um, there's a whole range of different ways of identifying as non-binary. Not everybody who identifies as non-binary will identify themselves as trans. So that's worth bearing in mind that different people will use these labels differently to apply to themselves. And beyond that as well, we've got gender non-conforming, which can be part of a trans identity or can be part of somebody who feels that they are cisgender but is aware that they don't conform to what they may perceive as quite narrow sort of definitions of what it means to be a man or a woman, but they may still identify within male and female or not. So transgender, according to the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, is a commonly and diverse humanly, human phenomenon that should not be judged as inherently pathological or negative. And we know from various societies that identifying um, as anything other than cisgender has actually been around for a really long time. Um, and it looks different in different communities, but we know that it's, it's not a new thing. In Western societies, it's becoming increasingly common and increasingly recognised, which makes some people perceive it as a new thing. Um, but it's worth kind of bearing in mind that actually different ways of looking at gender and different ways of, of practising gender have been around for a long time. So I wanted to just bring up at this point the treatment pathway for gender dysphoria. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on that because I'm, I'm not a gender definition. Um, I don't work in a uh, gender identity clinic or anything like that, but it's it's relevant to understanding young people who identify as trans or who may have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria to be aware of the treatment pathway that they could go down. It's also something that I want to bring up at the beginning as a sort of myth busting type thing because there's a lot of misinformation around what treating gender dysphoria in young people looks like. So currently the uh, Gender Development Service has a 36 week wait, um, which has decreased from over a year to two years. Um, in, so that, that decrease is quite recent um, because they've seen a, a huge increase in referrals in the last few years. So when a young person is referred to the gender service, they have a waiting period. Then they have an initial assessment over three to six appointments, which takes quite a few months. And then, so if they're a prepubertal young person, they don't have any physiological treatment at all. There's no medication that is given to them in relation to their gender identity at this point at all, if they've not started puberty. They can have supportive treatment, which can involve um, working with the family on how best to support them, working with school, um, having therapy or family therapy to address some of their difficulties, but it doesn't include any physiological needs. So at puberty or later, after, after sometime after the start of puberty, um, once the young person has reached at least TANF stage two and met lots of different criteria, they may have the opportunity to take GnRH analogs, which are commonly referred to as hormone blockers. So those are reversible treatments that cause puberty. And 
once the young person has reached age 16 or later, um, and if they meet lots of different criteria, they would have the option to take cross-sex hormones. So by that, I mean estrogen or testosterone. And they come in a, a variety of, of um, forms and treatments. And like I said, that's only if multiple criteria are met. And then only once they're 18 or later, do they have access to surgery? Um, so sometimes uh, media tabloids will refer to young people having sex change operations and those kind of sensationalist headlines. Um, and actually, if you if you look at this treatment pathway, that's that's really not what's going on. Um, and it's worth worth bearing in mind that this is really not a one way street. Um, not everybody ends up having genital surgery. Um, the treatment is individualized and there are trans people who don't want medical intervention. Um, and one of the main points of these hormone blockers is that they're a, they're a reversible treatment. They pause puberty, they don't stop it completely. And there will be some young people who start taking blockers and then decide that actually transitioning and having cross-sex hormones is not for them and at some point they stop taking the blockers and, and continue with the, the natural puberty that, that they would have had. So why is this important? Why, why are we even talking about this here? We're in a society and we practice medicine in a society where this is becoming increasingly recognised and, and increasingly important to the young people that we work with. Um, things are changing in society. For example, in the UK, um, there now being same-sex marriage. Um, transgender people are being increasingly recognised. Um, and that, that can come with its own problems. Sometimes that increasing visibility can cause increasing backlash. Um, but it can also cause increasing acceptance as well. So why is this important to you? Um, here's an example of an article. So a couple of years ago, Australia had a referendum on uh, whether gay marriage should be allowed, same-sex marriage. Um, and this was a really interesting article from paediatricians saying that actually this debate around same-sex marriage is really not helpful for children and young people. And that's whether it's children who have same-sex parents, but also adolescents who identify as in some way LGBT. Um, hearing all of this debate around them can be quite upsetting for them. And the paediatricians in Australia recognised that and they were seeing that in their practice. And that's the same kind of thing that we might be seeing in, in this country, even though we're not having any referendum, there's a lot of talk and debate in society around particularly gender at the moment, but also sexuality, and we might well see that represented um, in the young people that we work with. There's also the fact that the young people that you work with want you to know and be aware of how best to work with LGBT young people. So there's a national survey called Make Your Mark, um, which surveys 11 to 18 year olds. And in 2017, nearly a million of them answered this. And of the issues that they felt needed to be addressed, um, LGBT young people's rights came fifth nationally. And amongst the young people who were in hospital, they actually felt that this was the most important issue. Um, and that the people looking after them should should know to discrim to challenge discrimination. And also the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, um, they have a, a work stream called And Us, which is the Royal College working with young people and hearing from young people. And the young people working with them have specifically requested that they want to have paediatrics paediatricians and other child health professionals who are confident in talking about gender and sexuality. So it's it's not just us, the, the professionals saying we need to know this or, or people like me saying you need to know this. Um, it's also the young people that you work with saying we would like you to know this. 
and it's in your curriculum as well. Um, so the the recent Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health Progress curriculum includes a number of points on gender identity and sexuality, um, looking at specific health risks, such as the impact of acceptance or, or rejection on young people's health. Um, it asks you to be sensitive to families with same gender or transgender parents and asks you to be aware of inclusive language. And also another reason why it's important is that actually we know that the NHS is not very good at this. Um, there was a 2016 report into transgender equality that found that the NHS is letting down trans people and often discriminatory. So we know that, that we've all got work to do. Um, and we also know that there's homophobia and biophobia in healthcare. Um, so Stonewall uh, surveyed healthcare staff a few years ago and found that more than half of healthcare staff don't believe that sexual orientation is relevant to healthcare. Um, and a significant proportion have heard homophobic language from colleagues. Um, and even one in 10 of them have heard a colleague express the belief that being gay can be cured. Now, if someone's expressing that to a colleague, what's the chances that they might express that to a patient? It's, it's certainly a possibility. And how much harm could that have on a patient if a healthcare professional that they're trusting tells them that who they are can be cured? And nearly three quarters of NHS staff have had no training on the LGBT health. And looking at transphobia in healthcare, Again, staff have heard transphobic language from colleagues. And a quarter of doctors don't feel confident in meeting the needs of trans patients. Maybe that's a positive that people are recognizing that for themselves, but at the same time, how, how often is that need being addressed? We also know that 65% of trans patients have experienced negative interactions in a healthcare setting, which is really high. So why do LGBT young people have worse mental health? Um, I'm going to use a few case studies to illustrate some of the points here. So first of all, we're talking about Maya. She's 14 years old. She's come to A&E because she's taken a paracetamol overdose. You are one of the doctors in the department and you've been asked to assess Maya. You explore the reasons behind the overdose with Maya, uh, doing a, a HEADS assessment um, I can imagine lots of you are familiar with HEADS. For anyone who's not familiar with it, um, have a Google. There's lots of different resources, um, variations on the acronym. Sometimes there's three S's, sometimes there's two, um, depending on the, the resources that you look at. But it's, it's well worth having a read um, at this acronym that tells you about how to do a, a comprehensive uh, social history taking in adolescence. And so you ask, what about boys? Do you have a boyfriend? Maya goes a bit red and just looks out the window, avoids looking at you and, and generally looks quite awkward. And what's going on there is something called heterosexism, um, which means that there's a bias in society, but we all live in that society. So it affects individuals as well, um, where we're conditioned to expect people to live and behave as if everyone was heterosexual. Um, lots of us grew up watching Disney films um, where everyone in the Disney film uh, pretty much ends up in a happy ever after uh, handsome prince heterosexual situation. Um, and we see that often represented around us in, in mainstream media. Um, in the storybooks that we read as children and just in in general life um, so regardless of our own identity that's that's often an assumption that we've we've grown up with and that we expect of other people as well and you can see that that's represented in hospital forms for example so let's think about as ourselves why are healthcare professionals heterosexist why do we make those assumptions? Is there 
a sense of awkwardness? Is there a fear of offending a straight person if we ask them about their identity, their orientation? Is it particularly difficult as paediatricians, as people who work with young people, to see a young person as having a sexuality? Even though actually there's increasing research that shows us that a um, significant proportion of people who identify as lesbian, gay or bisexual were aware of their sexuality to some extent, even before the age of about 10. Um, there's also assumptions that we have around what an LGB person looks like. So might we have asked the question differently depending on what Maya looked like, the young person in front of us? Perhaps we might have been more inclined to ask the questions around sexuality and gender identity or, or ask more open questions if Maya looked particularly non-conforming, for example. But actually, we need to bear in mind that regardless of somebody's appearance or disability or religion or background, their identity could be anything at all. So consequences of these assumptions. Um, this could be a, a good point to put in the chat um, if you've got thoughts around what the consequences might be. But I've got a few suggestions here that it might mean you don't get all the information that you need. Um, it reinforces the idea that LGB people are, are something other, something different, something outside of the norm. And then that can cause a lack of trust in a healthcare professional. Um, and worst case scenario, it can it can cause the young person to, to disengage. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any other thoughts on, on how this can affect people. So back to Maya. How else could you ask Maya the questions that you need to ask? I don't know, Emma, if, if people want to unmute themselves at, them, at this point and give some suggestions, or if people are typing anything in the chat box. Yeah. So there's nothing in the chat box at the minute, um, but yeah, if everyone, if, if anyone wants to pop in the chat box, um, other ways that you could ask Maya the question, um, or feel free to unmute yourselves if you're comfortable doing that. We'll give you a couple of, maybe a, a minute just to, to do that. Silence. Um, so one of the ways that I might think about doing that is asking if you're and um, if they're in a relationship and just trying to keep it neutral and not. Yeah. Oh, there we go. And that Karen um, also uh, came up with that one as well. So are you in a relationship as a neutral way of asking Maya that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, a relationship is, is quite a, a nice sort of open term. So back to, to being with Maya, you ask her in a, a more inclusive way if she's in a relationship. Maya tells you that she has a girlfriend who she met online, but since everyone at school found out, she's been bullied for the last six months. She's felt really low and that her life is not worth living. So this is a, a good example of how um, LGBT young people might have difficulties with their mental health as a result of how other people are treating them because of it. And we know that LGBT young people have increased rates of depression, anxiety, substance use, eating disorders, self-harm and suicide. So that's a huge range of, of different problems that LGBT young people are, are experiencing at higher rates. Um, Stonewall did a survey three years ago and found that of the LGB young people, 61% had previously self-harmed and 84% of the trans and non-binary young people had self-harmed. Um, and again, suicide attempts, that's, that's higher than the background population, both for the LGB young people and for the trans and non-binary young people. And we know also that the risk goes up even higher if the young person has an intersection with another minority group. 
Um, so the Children's Society have done some really good research about this and found that, for example, uh, a girl who identifies as lesbian and is from a minority ethnic background has higher risk of mental health problems, higher rates of mental health difficulties than either white lesbian peers or heterosexual minority ethnic peers. Those um, discriminations that that young person faces kind of add together and, and increase the rates of mental health sort of exponentially really. And why is this? We know that self-harm and suicidality are, are strongly linked to stigma, social inequality, and the difficulties that young people face from the people around them. There's emerging evidence to suggest, particularly amongst trans and non-binary young people, that if they're supported in their identity, their mental health and well-being is actually pretty similar to their cisgender peers, if, if they're well supported. There's also some, some diagnostic overshadowing that complicates things, that trans young people are, are being told that they've got mental health issues because they're trans, even though to them it feels like there's other things going on. So what we know is that being LGBT in itself is not a mental health problem. Um, homosexuality was, was removed from the ICD and the DSM um, quite a while ago. Um, being transgender is still in there. Um, and there's debates around that and the wording is going to change in the next ICD of, of how gender dysphoria um, is, is diagnosed um, or is, is kind of referred to. But regardless, we, we know that being LGBT in and of itself does not particularly cause mental health problems. Um, people who are accepted um, can live very happy lives being LGBT and in and of itself, it doesn't cause a mental health problem. Sometimes the coming to terms with one's identity um, and the sort of overcoming some confusion around oneself can cause some mental health difficulties. But I wonder if those difficulties would really be there if being LGBT was totally accepted. You know, we, we don't have um, difficulties uh, thinking about our identities or, or preferences in life if they're not things that could result in discrimination from other people. Um, so perhaps if, if there was no homophobia, biophobia and transphobia, that confusion, that working oneself out that lots of adolescents go through um, wouldn't contribute to their mental health at all if, if the um, discrimination didn't exist. What we do know is that homophobia, biophobia and transphobia can very definitely cause mental health problems. We also need to think about coexisting mental health. So we know that autism spectrum disorder is higher in adolescents with gender dysphoria than it is in the general, general population. And there's lots of different theories about why that is. And I'm, I'm not going to go into that now. Um, but it's worth thinking about that and, and recognising that actually Regardless of gender, we know that autism spectrum disorder has an overlap with other mental health problems. So young people with autism are more likely to experience anxiety um, and sometimes depression. And we also know that there's a bit of an overlap with eating disorders and autism as well. That's being um, increasingly recognised, though, though, again, it's still sort of under recognised. But certainly if you look at a, a cohort of young people with, with eating disorders, you will find a a higher rate of autism if, if you look for it. Um, and so maybe those coexisting problems with gender dysphoria also um, could provide some explanation of why LGBT, or sorry, specifically trans young people have higher rates of mental health as well as the contribution from the discrimination that they're facing. So school. Um, School is often a place where people find things difficult. 45% of LGBT young people have been bullied for being LGBT. Um, and that's increasingly a problem online as well. Back to Maya. Maya tells you that she's also got some problems at home. She told her mum about her girlfriend and her mum told her that she's brought shame on the family. The family are very religious. 
Her mother has organised for therapy to make her normal at a local community centre. And mum wants Maya to go and live with relatives abroad and marry a man. So what do we think about this? Family rejection is a big problem for LGBT young people. Um, the Albert Kennedy Trust are a charity um, who specifically support LGBT young people facing homelessness. Um, they're, they're named after a young man, Albert, Albert Kennedy, who died by suicide in the 80s um, whilst he was looked after by children's social care and faced a lot of difficulties as a result, as a result of homophobia. Um, so of these homeless young people who are LGBT, 69% of them have increased, has experienced physical violence or aggression. So back to you guys, what can you do for Maya? What is your role here? I'll tell you in a moment what what my suggestions for what you can do are, but I'd really like to to hear what people think that they could do for her. Reaffirm her identity. Yeah, on. definitely. Yeah, empathy and and support are going to make a big difference to her in this in this situation. I'm really concerned about safeguarding issues with her mum wanting to, you know, send her abroad. This this conversion in the community centre. So I think that might need to be explored so that she can keep we can keep her safe. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm really glad that that someone's recognised that this is conversion therapy and and the risks around that. So what can you do? You can make a safeguarding referral. You can involve children's social care. You can refer her to CAMS because um, she's telling you that, that she's feeling really low and like she doesn't want to be alive anymore because things are so difficult for her. And it's also worth thinking about local LGBT youth groups. So a youth group isn't going to fix her problems, but it might make her feel less alone with what she's going through. Um, and I put the, lo the logo for consortium here because um, obviously the, the LGBT youth groups are going to be different depending on where you are. But Consortium is a good website that basically collects together all of the um, local LGBT uh, things that are on offer. So it's worth looking at that website and identifying what is local to you so that if you're in a situation where it'd be useful to signpost a young person to the provision that's local to them, you know what it is and you can you can tell them there's this there's this group happening. Um, so, for example, where I work in in Hackney, there's the Indigo project. Um, and if you tell a young person about that, they can find out about it and make contact with them rather than just sort of saying there's probably a, a youth group somewhere. So safeguarding. LGBT young people are at higher risk of all forms of abuse. And there's some really specific safeguarding risks for LGBT young people, such as forced marriage, honour based violence, conversion therapy, Conversion therapy has been in the news a little bit recently because there was a petition um, on the government petitions website saying that it should be made illegal. Um, and I think quite a lot of people were surprised to learn that it's not already illegal. And actually conversion therapy is completely allowed in the UK and it can take a whole range of different forms, whether that's just some talking therapy with quite a persuasive element to it, or it can take more extreme forms that can can be more like a physical exorcism of somebody's sexuality or identity. But what we know is that they don't work. They don't change somebody's sexuality or gender, but they do cause harm. Um, and it would be good if they were illegal. Um, the, the main body for counsellors and psychologists in the UK um, has a clear stance against conversion therapy and will deregister or strike off practitioners who are who are practicing conversion therapy but actually any practitioner can can practice it if they want to um, without needing to be a member of a professional body 
There's also the risks of meeting partners online. This could be older partners, this could be using apps, and this could be placing them at significant risk as well. And so safeguarding here. Sorry, go oh, on. Sorry, you may well be about to answer this. So there's just a question of on the point of conversion therapy. Um, I think um, the, the question in the chat bar, um, I think you've, you've covered some elements of that, the fact that it's not illegal, um, but the law relies on hate speech equalities act provisions to protect people from it. And how does that interact with the safeguarding process? Which I think you might just be about to, <laughs> to answer now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it, Yes, you could say that conversion therapy involves some hate speech and it, could it be a hate crime, but there are probably ways in which conversion therapy could get around that um, and could could argue that it's not a hate crime um, and it's not it's not specifically included in the law in that way. Um, thinking about safeguarding, so there's, there's two steps here, um, both of which are your responsibility. So firstly, the patient needs to feel safe to make a disclosure around what's going on, um, to, to make a disclosure around their identity, to make a disclosure um, and feel safe to talk to you around their sexuality or their gender. Um, and in things like conversion therapy or other safeguarding risks, they need to feel safe to be able to talk about that with you. And that's all around the, the setup that you're creating, the situation, um, and the empathy that you're showing to the young person that demonstrates to them that it is safe for them to talk to you. And then the second step of that process is that you as a member of staff recognize that this is a risk and you escalate it. So what we know is that 8% of 16 to 17 year old LGBT young people have been offered or have undergone some form of conversion therapy. Um, and even though 8% is not that high, if you think of all the 16 and 17 year old young people in the UK, and we know that a significant proportion of them will identify as LGBT, young, LGBT that is a, quite a huge number of young people that are affected by this. So moving on, case two, we've got Alison, who is a 13 year old, who you already know, um, she's got diabetes that's quite poorly controlled. She's come into hospital with a diabetic ketoacidosis again. And when her parents aren't there, Alison says to you, actually, everyone calls me Alex. And I just haven't told anyone at the hospital before because my parents don't really like it. Um, and you very sensibly ask what Alex's pronouns are. You, you ask what pronouns do you like people to use for you? And Alex says, I would prefer people to use they and them pronouns. And you offer to update the team and Alex would appreciate this. So names and pronouns. Half of trans people have had healthcare professionals use the wrong name or pronoun by mistake, and a quarter have been misgendered or misnamed on purpose, which is really disrespectful. It's often the case that people have the wrong gender or the wrong name listed on ID or on forms within the hospital. It can be a lengthy process to change these things, but it's still important for us to make all the effort that we can do to recognise people for who they are, regardless of what it says on the form. So back to Alex. You take Alex's bloods and you notice some self-harm scars. So you ask sensitively about what's going on. Alex starts crying. And you've clearly made it a safe situation for Alex to talk about what's going on. And they say, I hate hearing all the doctors and nurses calling me Alison and she. More and more, I hate my body and I want to get help, but my parents aren't sure. And I don't know what to do. And I feel so alone. So what can you do for Alex? What are your options here? So I guess one of the things I'd maybe think about is um, whether Alex wanted help to talk about this with her parents, whether that's something that she was, uh, that sorry, I've done it, haven't I? Um, something yeah. that, um, that they right were then. interested in. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good option. 
Any other ideas? I'm aware of time, so I'll keep us moving and hopefully people are thinking about what they could do. Yep. So you can ensure Alex's safety, first of all, um, and do a bit of risk assessing there. Um, if Alex is self-harming, we know that there's a, a higher risk of suicide in young people who self-harm, so you can ask about suicide. Um, you can refer to CAMS. This is a young person who's experiencing low mood, some distress, some self-harm. It might be appropriate for CAMS to help out here. Um, speak to your team again about Alex's name and pronoun. And again, there's some signposting that we could do. So Gendered Intelligence are an organisation that support trans and gender variant young people throughout the UK. Uh, they've got youth groups in London, Leeds, Bradford, Bristol, various places, but they're also doing a lot of online provision, particularly at the moment. Um, and they've got a lot of useful resources on their website. So if Alex is feeling alone, then Gendered Intelligence and also Mermaids would be a useful um, place to signpost them. Mermaids is a charity for trans young people as well. Um, and they've got, a, they've got useful resources for parents and scope for parents to talk to other parents in the same situation. And you could also consider the Gender Identity Development Service. So Alex's mum comes in and says, I had no idea my child was this sad or so serious about this. What should I do? What can you say to Alex's mum? Any ideas? I'll give people a couple of moments just to type. Point her to the resources. Yeah. Definitely. And there are um, often parents groups as well, isn't there? That, um, that can absolutely. be really helpful. Yeah, so Mermaids and Gentered Intelligence both run parents groups and the Gentered Identity Development Service themselves run a parents group as well. So the first thing probably that you can do is to reassure Alex's mum to, to tell her that things are going to be okay, there's going to be some support out there. Um, and, and to help her with this. So yeah, if people, as people have suggested, signposting. And you can talk to Alex's mum about the Gender Identity Development Service. She looks on the website and she asks you to make a referral. So third case, we've got Naz who's 15 and he comes to A&E um, with lots of fractures and nasty injuries. He's had a loss of consciousness and a headache. And he tells you that he was attacked when some boys from his school saw him with his boyfriend and some of them go to his mosque and now he's really distressed. He says, I'm never going to be able to go to the mosque again now that they know. I don't know what to do with myself. Please don't tell my parents why I got beaten up. So for Naz, what can we do for him? What, what do we have to tell his parents? How can we help? Are there any ideas coming? Oh, yeah. And um, be a supportive listener. Confirm he shouldn't be treated by like this. Yeah, definitely. The the empathy and the reassurance that you showed to Naz in this situation is going to help. I've got a few other suggestions. So safeguarding yeah. um, and ensuring confidentiality. I think there isn't a need to tell his parents the reasons why he got beaten up. Um, he's asked us not to tell his parents and that's not essential information for his parents to know about in order to keep them safe. It's worth bearing in mind that this is a hate crime um, and Gallup is the organisation that 
can help with hate crime. They help support LGBT people who experience hate crime, domestic violence, other um, crimes and discrimination on the basis of their gender and sexuality. So it might be that Gallup can help support him um, both in the legal process if the police are involved here, but also just supporting him through having had this experience. Naz is worried about going to his mosque now that other people know. Um, and there are specific organisations that can support people in Naz's situation. So in London, there's the Inclusive Mosque. There's also a charity called Hidayah, who are specifically for LGBTQI Muslims, um, who can support in, a, in an inclusive way. Um, and I've just mentioned here, just if Naz were to be Jewish and have a similar experience, there's um, two organizations who are very similar to Hidayah and the Inclusive Mosque, but for Jewish people. So what can you do more generally to help young people? Asking the questions. It's worth thinking here about how do you feel about asking these? Are you, are you confident on how to ask and what to say? And it's worth thinking in your head about what to ask and how to ask beforehand. Because actually we know, um, and this, this is from staff working in the Mental Health Trust, and although it's around asking adults, potentially the same um, difficulties could apply to paediatric staff as well. So a quarter of staff were awkward or embarrassed asking about sexual orientation. And there's lots of different reasons for that. We might feel it's too personal. We might feel afraid of offending someone. I mean, we do ask personal questions in healthcare, but we don't tend to ask too much about people's identity. Um, and maybe that feels a bit more difficult. And also it feels, it can feel difficult to find a way to make it feel relevant and not just sound nosy. Um, I find myself, I, I realize that I ask young people about their relationship status. And you know, like, like we talked about with, with Maya asking if she was in a relationship. Um, but actually, what about the young people who aren't in a relationship, but are still experiencing some discrimination? Are we missing that if we only ask about relationships? So it's worth thinking about how, how we ask and what we ask. I'm feeling confident about that so that young people don't think, well, I can't tell you because you look really awkward. Using inclusive language. So as we've said, not saying, do you have a boyfriend or girlfriend? Um, Avoid giving your patient a label that they haven't given themselves. So we're not referring to Naz as gay. He's told us that he was seen with his boyfriend. But if he hasn't used that term, that might not be a term that applies to him. He might be bisexual. He might use a different word. He might not have decided yet. And absolutely, please don't jump straight to sexual health. There are so many stories of LGBT people, particularly men, um, disclosing their sexual orientation to healthcare staff and immediately being offered an HIV test or being given a lecture on uh, sexual health. And we know that sexual health is important. And absolutely, as holistic practitioners, it's worth bringing that up. But if we go straight to sexual health, it reinforces this message that, that we got from the AIDS ads in the, in the 80s that people who were not straight, were somehow higher risk and, and spreaders of disease. And that's really not something that we want to go back to. So mention it as part of a, a holistic assessment, but don't go straight to that. What you can do, inclusive language, like are you in a relationship? How do you identify? Use the language that they're using for themselves. And ask if you don't understand the terminology that they're using. They might be using an identity that you're not familiar with. And rather than just write it down and move on, it's worth trying to understand what they mean and how what that means to them. Respecting names and pronouns, even if their relatives don't, actually it's our responsibility to treat the patient in front of us and not treat their relatives and family. Um, and if we don't know, Ask them, what name do you like to be called? What pronouns do you use? Um, and that amongst uh, young people who are trans or gender variant, 
they'll often be quite familiar with talking about their pronouns and saying, I use they, them, or please use she, her for me, whatever it is that they use. It might feel a bit of a strange question to us, but it's likely to feel much more normal to them. Um, and in situations where I have asked this of patients, generally, generally the, the response is that people feel really appreciative of this. Sorry, there's a bit of background noise here. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and check with the patient if they want the rest of the team updated and if they want their records updated, if you can, if you know how to do that or if you can signpost them for that. So I've mentioned the Gender Identity Development Service. It's a national service. It's run by the Tavistock and Portman Trust in London, um, but it actually has clinics all around the country. And regardless of where a patient is based, that is the service that is, is the only service that, that can treat gender identity in young people. So who can refer? Actually, you can refer. The GP can also refer, as can CAMS. However, you don't have to refer a young person to CAMS just for the purpose of support for their gender identity or just for the purpose of having a referral to the gender identity service. If there's a role for CAMS, if the young person is low in mood or self-harming or experiencing other difficulties, then absolutely get CAMS involved. But if actually what the young person wants is support for their gender, then you can refer them directly to the Gender Identity Development Service. Other healthcare professionals can, social services can, school can, young people and their families can't. There is no scope for self-referrals. Um, waiting lists are long. They are improved, I actually, sorry, I haven't updated this, but it was 20 months. Um, they're now saying it's about 36 weeks. But regardless, the sooner the better, because the young person is going to be waiting and for some young people, that wait is really hard, knowing that there is help out there, but that it's going to be a long time to access it. And we know that, that young people don't always uh, cope that well with having to wait a really long time for things. When you're 15, 36 weeks feels like much longer than it feels for an adult. Um, and it's worth thinking here um, about how that help does help people. Um, and the Scottish Transgender Alliance did a trans mental health survey um, a few years ago, but it was a really comprehensive study into trans people's mental health. And they found that people who'd experienced suicidal thoughts found that these were much higher before transition and generally much lower after transition. People were much less likely to experience suicidal thoughts after they'd gone through a process of gender transition and had been supported to, to live in, in their identity. So asking questions about gender identity. Healthcare professionals often feel like they need to know more um, and kind of make use of the patient in front of them to, to understand things better. But it's worth thinking about how relevant this is. Um, and much as we like to, to ask pertinent questions and understand the person in front of us, sometimes this can be inappropriate. If somebody's come in with a broken leg then asking them, yeah, adults have, have faced questions about genital surgery, um, for example. Um, and it's just worth thinking about other questions that you're asking, are they for the patient's benefit or for your own benefit? Um, and just think carefully about that. Because trans people do get asked questions that, that just make them feel like they're there to educate people. And some trans people are definitely keen to educate, but it's not helpful to assume that everybody will be. Um, and I just wanted to sort of sum up with this really good Canadian study um, looking at young trans people and it found that young trans people's mental and physical health were better when they were open with their GP and when they were comfortable with their GP. They had a lot of concerns that healthcare staff would be uneducated and for a lot of them that was why they didn't engage with healthcare. Um, so generally it found that supportive healthcare staff were associated with better healthcare outcomes for trans young people. So just to summarise kind of what I've gone through already and another one to another bugbear sometimes we put transgender 
in a patient's problems list. It's worth mentioning, but it doesn't have to be a problem. So there's a few different places you can educate yourself beyond this talk. Uh, the Royal College has got some great tips on working with trans patients. And these are tips from children and young people. And this is in the 2018 State of Child Health and Us report. You can find it on the Royal College website. Um, I'm afraid this is a shameless plug. Um, so this is an article that Jessica Salkind and I wrote in the BMJ around safeguarding LGBT adolescents. Yeah, totally shameless, but I think it's worth reading and worth having a listen to the podcast that went with it. Um, the podcast features a trans person talking about her, their experiences as well. Um, rainbow badges, these might be in your trust. Um, they're worth looking into as well. Um, and further resources, the Gender Identity Development Service website has got some really interesting uh, case, they're not really case studies, they're just people sharing their own stories, which are well worth a read and well worth directing families to them as well. Um, there's lots of places that you can learn more. There's various different reports and books around uh, healthcare for LGBT young people. And again, I've talked throughout this talk about signposting. Sometimes the most important thing and the most useful thing that we can do for our patients is not what we ourselves provide, but where we direct them to. Because if actually some peer support is the most useful thing to them or talking to somebody like a youth worker who identifies the same way as them um, or has a better understanding of, of where they're at than we do, then actually it's our responsibility to help them find the services that, that might be the most helpful. So any questions? Thanks so much for that, uh, Rosanna. I'm just, I'll keep an eye on the chat bar for any further questions. And um, sure. just um, in case, as we're wrapping up, just a reminder to everyone to please complete the feedback um, form. It'd be really, really helpful. Nothing there. Brilliant. Oh, wait, yeah. i um, got a question here. Um, do you know of any other inclusive religious groups for other religions? So you mentioned the Muslim and the Jewish one. Um, any other? That's a really good question. So within within Christianity, there's actually a whole a whole church, a whole a whole branch of Christianity that is set up for inclusion, um, and it's called the Metropolitan Community Church, um, which is a church that um, it, it's a general church um, which has some evangelical background, but um, yeah, overlaps with lots of different parts of Christianity. Um, that is explicitly inclusive of LGBT people. Um, and generally sort of quite widely inclusive. They have a lot of um, sign language interpretation of their services, for example, um, but they are specifically inclusive of LGBT people. Um, so that could be a good place to direct a young person. Um, there's also an organization called Iman, um, I-M-A-A-N, which is another um, organization uh, for Muslim LGBT people. Um, but my understanding is that Hidayah is kind of more active at the moment. Um, in terms of other religions, I'm not too sure what else exists, I'm afraid. That's great, thank you for that. Um, I can see I the chat see now. The um, oh, yeah. <laughs> great. Well, um, yeah, if anyone wants to email me any questions or any further thoughts, um, or if anyone wanted to access the bmj paper but doesn't have access to it um then perhaps if they email you and you can forward it to me i can send yeah. people the paper or answer yeah. any further questions yeah no that's great yeah happy to field those um, and my email address um is on the timetable and um, so yeah if you want to talk and um, email me or one of the other organizers if if there's questions that you um, want me to pass on to row or requests um, regarding yeah. um, some of the um, content yeah. that she and um, that she mentioned then please please feel free to do that and people oh, can find me on you. Twitter as well. I realised that normally I put put my Twitter handle on the title page and I didn't. It's at Bevan Row, um, and I often tweet about these kind of things and people can ask questions there as well. Great. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for organising this. I'm looking forward to get, catching some of the other talks this week. So thanks for organising. Yeah.
Yeah, no, no problem at all. Um, and um, you'll see, um, it will take us a few days, but we'll have the video um, video um, of this uploaded. So if you want to kind of point people in the di direction of it, um, we'll make sure we let you know when that's when that's up there. Brilliant, thank brilliant. You. Thank you very much. Lots of thank yous in your chat. Oh, you can see the chat bar now, can't you? But there's lots of I thank yous. I can now, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you. you so much. And thanks, Emma, for your help with that. No problem. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye.